Hey, good morning. It's Saturday morning. I'm up at the office. I'm going to try a new experiment. If you like this, please like the video and subscribe to the YouTube channel and comment below so that I know that you like this. So the experiment is this. I went back through five or six of my more recent videos and I screenshotted questions from the comment section. And I'm going to do somewhat rapid fire the answers. If you know me, I'm not very good at fast answers. I love this stuff and I can get talking. But I'm going to attempt to go through the questions pretty quick. If you comment on this video and you and say you like this and you like this video, then that will tell me that I should keep doing this. And maybe once a month, I don't I don't want to make too big of a promise here. We'll see what happens. But maybe once a month, every X number of weeks, I'll go back through the most recent videos and I'll screenshot questions real quick before I hop into it. One of the things you might think about is if you if this ends up getting liked and I continue doing this, when you ask me a question, you'd be better off posting a couple questions and breaking them into smaller chunks because I'll, I'll tell you that as I scan through the questions quickly, if it's multiple paragraphs and it's three questions in one, it's a little bit more difficult for me to get excited about answering that because I'd have to read a lot to those listening. So if you could break your question into several quick questions for me, smaller questions, higher probability I'd pick one of your questions. So I hope you like this. I hope it works out. It might be interesting. Uh, let me know if you do like it. And then if you do post comments, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you'll get notified when I put videos out like this. So let's jump into it. I don't know how long I'll go for, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna zip through some of these. All right, from Luke, Jonathan, what type of truck does your company use now? We use Isuzu NPRs, gas powered, because we don't drive tons of miles. We serve a small market. We use uh, Dodge ProMasters. There's plenty of alternatives to the Dodge ProMaster. It just so happens that we can get that truck built out the way we need it. And it can uh, handle three people in the cab. So there's just some factors that made that the truck for us. We use a lot of Ford F-150s. Um, and we have, a, we have other trucks like Ford F-350s. We, have, we still have a bunch of old Rangers from back in the day that are still running great and have custom beds on them. But if I were to summarize it, my understanding this, these days is we're predominantly moving forward with the Dodge Pro Masters and the Isuzu NPRs. And there's a place for the Ford truck with a bed or pull off the bed and kind of put a custom bed on there. That's the, the predominant lineup for us at this point. Oliver, elaborating on overhead recovery would be a nice second part to that video. I know what video you're referring to. Next week, I am in uh, Vegas with about 80 members from Academy, and I will be uh, there with a friend of mine by the name of Jason Cup. I've already talked to him. We're gonna do a little, a couple videos that dig into some of this overhead stuff and cost of goods sold and a few things like that. So be look on the lookout for those videos in a couple weeks. Um, continuing on, also dealing with drive time and what ballpark percentage is a good overhead target. All right, we'll take that into account. Um, I will tell you real quick that this is a challenging one in that your drive time is going to vary by route. So as an example, you might have a Thursday route. If we're talking about mowing, fertilization, weed control, whatever that service offering is, pest control, and that, that Thursday route's super tight. And as a result, the drive time as a percentage of gross revenue for the route that day is low. Whereas on your Wednesday route, you're in a different market, you're driving further to get there, or maybe you're growing this new market. So your, your properties are scattered across lots of neighborhoods or areas. And as a result, uh, your drive time as a percentage of the total day is a bigger number than other days. And it's okay because you are investing in new areas. You're trying to grow them out. You're trying to build density. It doesn't mean that you're suck, you suck or you're doing anything wrong. It just means you might be investing in that area. So the way you drive down your drive time as a percentage of the day is to be marketing into those neighborhoods, to those areas, or if you're in commercial selling commercial clients around those areas, whatever the case might be. So think of it as an investment. When you see a route that has high drive time, it doesn't mean the rest of the jobs on that route are bad. It simply means you need to sell more work into that route and make that route from a drive time standpoint as efficient as other routes inside your organization that are great. Third line, your input on when to hire a production manager would also be great. Uh, production manager, I assume you means operations manager. I see uh, the lack of hiring of an operations manager or at least an operational assistant to be one of the biggest mistakes that ma the majority of companies are working with. I'll refer to Academy again. 
Um, I just know a ton of individuals uh, because of this thing we do called Service Autopilot Academy. And there's a lot of Academy members. We have lots of Academy members, a million dollars and greater in revenue, but we also have a lot of Academy members that have joined that I've had a few that have joined before they even started their companies. Um, usually I wouldn't let someone like that in, but I could tell they were gonna kick ass and they were gung ho. And, and the reason I wouldn't let them in is because it's just, they just need to do some other things before they're ready for Academy. Um, but my broader point here is we've, we've let a bunch of two and $300,000 revenue companies, gross revenue companies into Academy. And if you look at them now, they're million dollar plus businesses. And one of the reasons that many of them are, not all, but one of the reasons that that becomes possible is because they finally hired an office person first to help them. And then second, they hired an operational person to take that off their plate. For most business owners, they're more wired to do sales and estimates than they are to be great managers. And so for most, not all, it's better to get an operations manager before it's wise to get a salesperson. Sell, hiring salespeople is tough. Um, it's it's a high, there's a high level of failure in hiring salespeople. You got to do it to eventually to get a bigger business, but it's one of those things you can kind of kick down the road. And for most, you get office first, then you get operations manager. What happens is in, until you hire the operations manager, you're wearing all the hats. You're you're doing estimate sales, accounting, operational stuff, running parts, running supplies. You're doing all that, and you have no time, no freedom. You're underwater. You're starting to get burned out in the business. If you get an operational manager, oftentimes you can offload 30, 40 percent, if not 50 percent of all your work to this person if they're the right person. Person magically, quickly frees you up. Now you can go focus on growing the business. It's usually the top hurdle that makes most companies plateau. If you look at the data in our industry, hardly anybody, I'm exaggerating, but the mo most do not get past about 400, 500,000 in revenue. That's the brick wall that almost takes, takes the majority of people out. If you look at their businesses, most don't have an operations manager. Uh, some have office, many don't have office. That's one of the biggest reasons they hit a brick wall. And there's a whole lot of other reasons, but those are some of the big ones. Troy says, enjoy your videos, but so much is focused on advertising numbers. There's not a lot about the actual lawn care business. If I did not already know you were in the lawn care landscaping business, it sounds like you're just talking about general business for any business. For example, you're not talking about the types of equipment, types of trucks. You're not talking about employee hiring problems and solutions. Um, anyway, still enjoy your videos. It's a top three YouTube channel about lawn care stuff, in my opinion. All right, thanks for saying that. Um, you're correct. Um, this is not my first go round in business, and I've been part of clean of building now uh, multiple companies, three of which have exceeded 10 million a year in revenue. And I've been involved in some other businesses. I've had a few that didn't didn't make it. I've had a few that only made a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, I love business. I love this stuff, and it's you know I could never really imagine retiring and not doing this stuff. Someday I'll start another company. Um, I plan to keep going. I, I just love this stuff. And the thing that and I know a lot of people in business are extremely successful. I've uh, come to know a lot of people that make a million dollars plus a year take home that are in business. Most people say that stuff's not possible. There's tons of people doing it. It's very simple. The commonality in everything I've done and most of the people I know are highly successful. They don't talk about the same stuff everybody else talks about. They don't think about the same stuff everybody else thinks about. So what you're seeing with me in these YouTube videos is I don't walk around thinking about that stuff. And I'll elaborate a little further here, but it just doesn't matter. And I and I'm not, I don't want to put you off or sound like um, any. I don't want to come across wrong, and I'm not. Um, I just want to be careful in how I'm saying that. I don't mean anything negative about that. I just don't think about that stuff because that stuff doesn't matter at the end of the day. And it, and it kind of does. But and, I'll, and I'm going to spend a little more time on this answer here. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. Like if I thought about that stuff, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Somebody else can think about that stuff. Somebody else can worry about that stuff. That's that stuff in the broad scheme of. And that stuff meaning trucks and equipment, what kind of chemical am I going to buy? What kind of deal am I going to negotiate on my trucks and equipment? What kind of deal am I going to negotiate on the chemical? Um, employee stuff, absolutely. Top, 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 top of the list. Employee problems, hiring, recruiting, like these are the most important things to be talking about. You're probably right. I probably don't record enough on that. And I do live in that world. I think about that constantly. But granted, I have teams around me that do most of the hiring at this point. I'm sort of like just the last stop to say, not going to happen. This isn't the right person for the company. But in terms of hiring, the businesses I'm part of have all become big enough that like in the lawn care business, I haven't hired anybody in that business in, I haven't hired a single person in that business since 2010, 2011. Somebody else has hired everybody. I've never even met those, the, the people that have been hired since 2010. And so it's a totally different business because I, I got a team that runs it and, and they're incredibly awesome people. 
And at this business, where I'm sitting in the service autopilot office right now, I've got COO, we got VP of sales, I got a, uh, I got people that do all of that. And so, if you're going to get hired at our company, you're probably going to interview with five different groups, five different people. You're going to make it to me last. And by that point, it's basically just do I think they're a culture fit? Did I pick on some up on something that other people didn't pick up on? But other than that, it's all done by other people at this point. But and I got off track there. I simply want to say you are correct. When it comes to hiring and managing and performance and all that, the, uh, that is the single most important stuff to be thinking about. When you get into trucks and equipment, that stuff doesn't matter. None of that stuff got me to where I'm at. And as a result, my brain doesn't think about that stuff because if I'm thinking about that stuff, the business, business isn't moving in the right direction. Like at the end of the day, yes, there are differences between equipment, there are differences between uh, trucks. But those differences are not the difference between what will make you successful or not make you successful. If I happen, like for years we ran a, a, a brand, I don't wanna say what the brand was. We ran the brand, which would have been slightly subpar to a different brand that we could have been running, but we had a wonderful relationship with the vendor. And as a result, we bought that brand because they didn't represent the other brand of equipment that we really wanted to buy. But the relationship was so good, so strong, that we, we used a slightly subpar piece of equipment. But in a day, did it matter? No, it didn't matter. Did it cost us maybe a little bit more to run it? Yeah, maybe a little bit. That had nothing to do with growing the company. Like, it, it just it was just a little blip on the profit and loss statement where we spent a little bit more money on equipment than maybe we had to spend in terms of maintenance and such, but it didn't matter. This stuff matters, but doesn't matter. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make. And so that's why you don't hear me talking about it. What's What matters is marketing. What, what most of us do, and I was very guilty of this, we run around working on systematizing our business. We run around thinking about trucks and equipment. We, we run around thinking about all this other cool stuff. Um, and it's an excuse in many cases not to do the hard work of learning how to market, learning how to sell, getting really good at estimating, learning how to win business, and then managing people and growing people and hiring people. Like that's the real game of business. Everything I just said, and then understanding the financials of our business, understanding what it means to make money, how to be pricing, how uh, efficient you are on an overhead standpoint, how efficient you are on all these other cost factors inside your organization. That stuff, that's what builds a company. And everything I just named, it works in the software industry, it works in the lawn care industry, it works in the cleaning industry, it works in the plumbing industry, it works in every industry that you could rattle off to me that you might or anyone might entertain being in. It's the same formula. It's the same key things that matter. So I live in the world of what matters across businesses. I live in the world of what matters that moves the lever, what actually gets companies to the next level. If I thought about all the other stuff, I'd never have got to where I'm at today. And, and I've learned that, and I've learned it from reading books, I've learned it hanging around really successful people, and I've heard, learned it from experience. When my mindset shifts and I think about the right things and I work on the right things, I magically get results. When I worry about the other stuff, I don't get results. That's like working on the 5% of things, like it's the 80-20 rule. I live in the world of what's the 20% that will get me 80% of the result. If I live in the world of working on the 80% that will only get me 20% of the results, everything goes slow, my life sucks, everything's hard, it's complicated, I burn out. That's not the world I want to live in. So that's the backstory. The problem is I just don't think about that stuff. And so I probably need to bring more people onto the channel that can talk about that stuff. Cause I, I'm not even maybe sometimes even the best person to talk about cause I don't care about it. I love trucks, equipment. I'm like a car guy. Cars are my favorite thing. And, uh, but, but when it comes to business vehicles don't matter. And even though I love that kind of stuff and I have it in my personal life and I've had it for years and years and I race cars and do all these other things though, that's like my passion. But that stuff does not matter when it translates into business. So I do not think about it from a business standpoint. I only think about it from a personal standpoint to go race or have fun or do something of that sort. All right, I uh, love your videos. They are the best. I do wish in every video you would tie in what you're talking about with Service Autopilot and how Service Autopilot helps uh, make the task easier. I just wanted to comment on that. I appreciate that comment. I just simply want to say the reason I don't want to do it is I don't want to make this a, a pitch fest for Service Autopilot. My ideal is that I can deliver a ton. I'd love to talk more about that and you know, and I 100% believe in it. I've got massive amounts of money invested in Service Autopilot. It's probably the single biggest area of wealth for me. My lawn care business is pretty dang good as well, but it's, so oh, I do, I'd love to do more of that. But my dilemma is at the end of the day, I just want to deliver a ton of value so that you can take action inside your organization. And of course that would add more value, but I don't want to turn people off from watching the channel. If you can, if you can get something from this and you're not turned off because I'm pitching that all the time, then there's a higher probability you'll go find transformational change inside your business. So I just don't want to, I don't want to become that kind of a, a channel. That's why I don't do it. Um, Jonathan, I've uh, been trying to get into your group and seek mentorship. 
Can you help me with my business? I don't know how to hire and um, experience burnout t- tremendously in every way. I may I, was, I butchered that when I was reading it, I apologize. I guess the group you're probably talking about is Academy. Um, real fast, if you go to Service Autopilot, the website, and you go to under learn, I can't remember where it's at, you'll see a place for Academy. Put your name on the waiting list. We only open up Academy once or twice a year. Last year we only opened it once. If we open it again, um, well, we will open it again this year. We might do it at our conference in November, but we're, we've just been talking about opening it up in June. If we do so and you're on the waiting list, I'll let you know when that comes about. The reason I put this question in here was not to say that. I would highly recommend that you find a mentorship program. I did um, in my early 30s and uh, it was a pretty big deal. That's one of the ways that I've come to know and meet a lot of extremely successful people. It broadened my thinking, it changed my thinking, it keeps me motivated, kept, uh, keeps me thinking about the future and what's coming. So um, half the game of business is managing your energy level, uh, remaining confident and avoiding burnout. So I would, in, I would recommend you find something like that. Clearly Academy is very much based for this industry, but there are other groups out there that are good, like EO, Entrepreneur Organization, YPO, but you gotta have a bigger business to get into that. There's some different groups like that that you can find. I will tell you that a lot of local groups that are just formed by individuals wanting to get together, they almost never last. I've tried a few of those. The almost the only thing that ever lasts is a paid group. So just be comfortable with ponying up some money to get into a paid group. They tend to be by far better, but I would keep looking around if Academy is not something for you. I would highly encourage you to join a group. Uh, You might consider to do things like coming to GIE. Um, GIE is pretty good. Um, The the real value in my mind around GIE is meeting other people. So if you'll come and you'll make an attempt to meet other individuals, I would do that because that's where the value is, is getting to know other people. But when you're seeking out other individuals, look for people that are ahead of you, that have successful businesses. I've come to conclude most of the conversation in the industry amongst each other is, uh, or a lot of it is about how crummy the industry is or how hard it is or how no, there's no money to be made and all of that's wrong and it's all nonsense. And as a result, uh, you gotta be careful who you're talking to and hanging out with um, because the industry is actually pretty fantastic and there are a lot of people that are doing well. Um, Taffy, you absolutely, you're absolutely correct. I don't remember what the context was. I was just grabbing comments. Absolutely love everything you say. Um, okay, thank you. You are, a, okay, thank you. Um, thank you again. Oh, I know why I put this in here. Hope one day I can meet you. Okay, the reason I put that in there is simply to say, I'm at GIE every year. I've been there for five years now. I'll be at GIE this year. So that's in Louisville, Kentucky. It's in October. If you wanna meet me, that's come see me. I'll be at the Service Autopilot booth at GIE there the entire time. Um, there's a, an event that's being hosted by um, uh, the Long Care Rookie, Naylor. You can look at the Long Care Rookie channel. It's a, an event. I won't go into all the details. You probably, you might already know about it. He hosts this event at, at GIE. And there may be some other people involved that I'm failing to mention their name, but I know Naylor of the Long Care Rookie, and I know he's, a, he's a hosting this event. I will be uh, in attendance at that event this year. That'll be an opportunity to meet me. Um, if you come to SA5, six, SA6 this year, that's our big event in uh, Dallas. We're about to announce it. It's our sixth annual event. Um, That's an opportunity to meet me. I'm there and present the entire time. I hang out with everybody the whole event at night. I stay out late. I'm involved, very involved. Like I'm everywhere. You you will have no problem finding me and talking to me. Those are some ways you can meet me. And the other thing is, I mean, my world's just so busy. I have multiple businesses. I have a wife, I have kids, I have hobbies. I have like a lot of friends. You know, I got things going on. I got friends, we go out and do stuff. I travel a lot. Um, My point here is that it's just really hard for me to to, uh, show up in too many other places. And as a result, those are probably the two best ways to find me. If you happen to be a service all pilot member and you come to in-house training, um, I try to uh, pop in and say hi and have lunch. Um, and periodically I try to make myself more available than that. Just depends on how busy it is at the time that you happen to come to Dallas. Hey, Jonathan, right now my business cannot afford, this is James, Service Autopilot. In the future, will you be moving? I will be moving over to that software. I know this is a long shot, but will you guys be offering automation feature in the public, non-Service Autopilot users? Um, okay, so the reason I'm answering this one is, uh, uh, James, I just wanted to say that no, we, we will only be offering automations through Service Autopilot. And the reason for that is because the data and the capability that is included inside Service Autopilot is what drives automation. So for example, for us to solve your collections problems, we or follow up on past due invoices or whatever the case might be, we have to know about your 
uh, what money's owed, who owes you that money, how to contact them, all of those details for the automation to function. For us to upsell a bi-weekly client into weekly, for us to sell fertilization, we control the clients at the exact right time, to us to sell aeration, for us to do any of those upsells via text message, email, voice blast, direct mail, any of that stuff, it's got, we gotta know all that data. We gotta know who the client is, we gotta know what they're buying now, what they're not buying, what time of year it is, so that the automation can do all that stuff. And I can just go down the list of a bazillion things that automations can do. If you want us to audit, you know, market to them based on their birthday, based on when they became a client, if you want us to do follow-ups on you know, challenges or problems, if you've got a client that's at risk and there's a customer service element, if you want us to do MPS, if you want us to follow up and, um, and do get reviews that, or any of that stuff, I gotta know the data of the client, I gotta know what they buy from you, what they don't buy from you, when they became a client, have they terminated, are they a past client, are they a lead? I gotta know all the, how much money they owe you, how many days past due are the invoices? I gotta know all that. And by knowing all that, then the automation can take action. And without knowing that, the automation just doesn't have its the same power. Uh, Joseph, it is great that you're reviewing your comments. This is what prompted me to do this little experiment here and see if you guys like this. Um, I know I've just said several things about Service All Pied Academy. I was just, I, that's was some of the predominant comments here recently for whatever reason, because I think I, for the first time, showed some Service All Pied stuff. Most of the time when I'm replying to things, it's not gonna be tons of Service All Pied stuff, just to make sure you're clear. Um, it is great that you're reviewing comments to your previous videos and answering a ton of questions. Thank you. Um, and those of us that want to crush it in business will be tuning in to upcoming videos. Uh, this is in here simply because this is what gave me the idea. Thank you, Joseph, for doing what I'm doing right now. All right, I'm gonna drag that down the list. That one looks like it's gonna take me a little bit longer. The choose your right equipment guy from the most recent growth guide needs to be uh, have more screen time. That is Bear, he is on our sales team. Bear is awesome, he's been with us for years. That, his name's Bear. Um, the simple marketing guys, guy had some great info too. The simple marketing guy, I believe that was Patrick, if I'm remembering correctly. Patrick it runs the marketing team at Service Autopilot, just so you know who they were. Um, Michael, how do I add the gross square feet to Service Autopilot to make it show on the report as a custom field? You can create custom fields for anything you want. So you might have a net, uh, a net square footage. Uh, or like turf, you might have gross, you might have number of irrigation zones, you may have, do they have dogs, you may have all these different factors. You can just create them as custom fields, that data will get stored in there. And then the uh, estimates, the estimates, uh, pricing your work, price matrix, automations, all kinds of things key off of those custom fields for you. So just put them into custom fields. And then uh, that report that I was using, if I'm remembering correctly, was built in our custom report builder. So we have canned reports, but we, you can build whatever reports you wanna build. Um, that report uh, was under custom reports, and then I just added the columns of custom fields. I picked which custom field I wanted to put on the report. That's how it got on there. Um, Steve says, hey, Jonathan, I have a question. If you could go back to the beginning of your lawn care uh, business, what is the one thing you would do that would make it easier and more profitable to grow? I'd start credit, charging credit cards from day one. I, I would have every client pay me the week that I do the work or the week after I do work. Um, because it was a, it was the way that we financed the company. Um, these businesses buying trucks and equipment and everything that comes with it, hiring lots of people, that's expensive and, uh, and it costs money. And the only way to be able to afford it is to get paid really, really fast. And that was sort of the secret sauce. It was one of the secret things. I mean, at the end of the day, learning how to do marketing was probably the single most important thing. Um, but after that, because that allowed me to grow the business, but after that, it was how do you finance that growth? and that would be uh, through credit cards. Another one I'd put up there at the top, my answer is gonna be credit cards. It's, it's just unbelievably important. That's why we've built into Service Autopilot such incredibly powerful credit card processing where it can just essentially do it with a couple clicks because uh, I believe in it at that level. Uh, the other thing I would throw out on the table is it was finally figuring out how to find and hire good people. It took me a really long time. I didn't think they were available at all and then I started to, had my mind changed. But this guy by the name of Elder from Guatemala, he was awesome um, and he totally changed my mind on uh, what it meant to find great people and what great work looked like. Okay. Two more, what do you do if you're drowning in debt? You um, find somebody that can help you understand your numbers, um, such as um, understanding your overhead, understanding your cost of goods sold, understanding uh, what break even is on pricing. You just, you, the, the first place to start is looking at the work that you have right now and the prices at which you're selling work and figuring out 
are you or are you not profitable um, if in, and how much money you are really making and figuring out what you need to get your pricing to and what you need for selling new work and what you need to get your pricing to with existing clients, what you need to raise it to so that you can get to a place of break even. What parts of the work that you're selling right now and the business that you have now needs to go away, quit doing it. And what areas do you need to go target and get more work in those areas from those clients in those service areas or geographic areas so that you can be selling profitable work. And once you do that, then you can dig yourself out of the debt hole. Until you do that, the debt will never get better. It will only get worse. And so that is literally step number one. For most companies in debt trouble, they should, for the most part, stop growing until they do that, figure out what the issue is that's creating that problem, and then make a plan, and then they can work on uh, growing their way out of that. And uh, lots of companies have done it, and many have done it very quickly, but it all starts with what I said first. Great information. I'm, this is my last question. I'm still very green in, in the selling of my services and my estimate but I know what the other guys are charging who are established professionals and the chuck in the truck guys' prices. Established businesses are so busy around here that they likely won't touch this property without a total package agreement from the owner, okay, or from the customer. The chuck in the truck guy, neighborhood kid, will do it for 35 a week. I've got a 12,000 square foot lawn in the middle in a middle class neighborhood. I wish I knew if this was 12,000 square feet gross lot or turf, because that is a big difference. 10 or 15 objects to trim around trees and such. If I went with what I think, which is 60 to 70 a week, I'll probably lose out to another competitor, Chuck in a truck. Um, it will probably take me 45 minutes. Is this 45 minutes to do this on your own? Okay. Um, he has a gate to it's flat, has a gate to the backyard that my ZTR fits through. I'll probably quote her 50 bucks and it will help fill my route for now. I think you are getting started when you, okay, I'm gonna skip a few of these things. You can always, oh, actually that looks like it's pretty important. I think as you're getting started, it's important to get the clients even if you can't get the premium. You can always switch the, as long as you're not losing money, like it needs to still be profitable. Just getting clients for the sake of getting clients and could at risk of costing you money um, is, is not. Now, if you're, I, I gotta make a bunch of guesses here. If it's just you and you're gonna charge 50 bucks to do a job that'll take 45 minutes, even though you have a ZTR, um, assuming that you didn't drive way across town for this one job and you're never gonna end up getting other jobs around that job, you're not losing money at $50. You're, you're, I, you're not. I, I'm pretty certain you're not losing. At $50 on a 45 minute job by yourself, you're not losing money. You could build a business around that. And you, as you're saying, you can always upgrade clients later. I would agree with that statement at this number that you just represented. Because I don't believe you're losing money there. You can always switch the client out for a premium client as you acquire those properties. Sound reasonable? Yes, as I'm understanding it. I don't offer spraying, so that's out. One day think about that, but you're right not to get into that too soon. I do offer mulch, hedge trimming, and annual color. Those are usually the easiest things to get into when you start, when you're predominantly offering mowing. So there could be an upsell there. What do you uh, do in this situation? And then uh, this individual made an additional comment. I do charge 45 a man hour for regular labor here, so I think I'm in the black. The thing is, and I don't know if I know you, because uh, I'm not good about knowing company names, I know people's names, so um, I may know who you are and I just don't realize who I'm talking to here. Um, I, I don't know what market you're in. I don't know where your business is located. So $45 a man hour in Toronto, I couldn't say for sure, may not be awesome, but $45 an hour in parts of Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, and all kinds of other markets throughout the United States is a sustainable number and a workable number, it, it, depending on the service offering, uh, depending on the labor cost in your market could be low, but for a lot of companies, it's a workable number. It's definitely not a, uh, it's definitely not a number at which you are uh, generally losing money. Um, but I, you know, I don't know enough details to say. So um, finally, he goes on to say, I am solo. There's my answer. Okay, so everything I just said before, I still agree with. A little more of the story, I can do this lawn on the way to two more lawns. That's a plus. I would do the same day uh, so that drive is not a factor, maybe five minutes from another account. Okay, so based on what I've heard, you're gonna charge um, my gut feeling, and again, this is where we have to talk and look at your data. My gut feeling is that if you were charging $45 for this lawn, um, man, I'll go a step further. If you were charging 
man, uh, 35 to $40 for this lawn by yourself and your lawns are close together, you're not losing money. And you can build a business around that. The thing to really understand is that as you're building your business initially, the it's going to be less profitable. It will feel more profitable because you're doing all the work, which means you're billing time, which means you're only making X number of dollars per hour. Then you have you go to this next phase where now you're starting to hire people and those people are now costing you money. They're investments at the end of the day. They're, you're investing in them to make you more money, but they're costing you an hourly rate. And as a result, it you're there for a short period of time, your personal income might be dropping because you're not building as much personal work now. They're doing more of the work and now you're doing more sales and estimating. And so it feels like you're less profitable and you only are temporarily while you're investing in additional people to come in and provide leverage so you can go faster. And so my point in telling you that is that, um, heck, I sort of lost my point in telling you that. Oh, oh, I know what it was. Generally what you're gonna see in a business is you're not, you become more profitable as you get bigger. The economies of scale, the tightening of your route, the uh, finding other people to do the work will make you more profitable in the long term. You'll go through these phases where you're doing really good because you're out there building all the work yourself. Then you start getting people and all your profits drop, drop. The amount of money you can take home drops. You got to keep investing in the business, sell, 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 get more people. And then your income starts going back up. And then you're like, oh, I need an operations manager. And this, you hire this person, then your income drops again. You start selling more work. You get more people he's managing or she's managing all them. Then your income goes up, up, up. That's sort of the game of growing the business. And that's why a lot of people get stuck is they can't withstand that short-term period of time where their income drops while it's about to start growing again. And therefore, they stop growing. They, they panic. They're like, oh, no, my profits are down. I got to get rid of these people. I'm doing something wrong. And, and that's not really what's happening. So my point in telling you this is that nothing about the numbers you just said make me nervous. Um, and yes, you're right. You, can, you need to get enough work so you have enough density so you can start to cover overhead so you can get some people working for you. And as you start to learn the numbers of your business, you can always come back and raise prices, upgrade clients, start marketing in new areas, stop focusing on other areas. But in the beginning, you just need to get enough work to create that base, but you need to get it, it to be profitable work. And everything I'm hearing here makes me think that you're not at risk of this being unprofitable work. I'd have to know more to give a better answer, but that's my gut feeling based on what I've just heard. All right, I went for a pretty long time on this video. Um, if you like this format, if you like this, if you'd like me to answer your questions, comment on this video, like this video, subscribe to the channel. That will tell me I should do this again. And I'll do and what I will do, as I said before, I'll just go grab the last four or five, six videos that I recorded. I'm not gonna bother going back to old comments. I'm just gonna grab it off the, the most recent videos and I'll grab comments that are pretty quick and easy for me to answer. And I will do exactly what I did. I screenshot them and then I'll answer them periodically in a video of this format. Um, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, see you later. Have a great week.